Okay, well, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 16. And um, carrying on really from where we, we left off last week. Um, I want us to look particularly at verse 20 this morning. Um, but I'm going to read from verse 17 to verse 20. And uh, may, maybe somebody's thinking, oh, I thought we would have a, a resurrection message this morning. Well, let's, let's see what happens with this one, shall, shall we, this morning. <laughs> Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offences, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Um, Joe, in, interestingly, that's the first time in, um, in Paul's epistle to the Romans that Satan is mentioned. It's the first, in fact, the only time in 16 chapters that he mentions Satan. Uh, oh, I mean, it could be argued there are, there's a couple of verses in, uh, in chapter 8 where, where he's referred to indirectly as the one who accuses us. But by name, this is the only place in all the epistle where Satan is mentioned by name. And I think that um, just as an aside this morning, we, we perhaps ought to take something away from that. that you, you know, maybe, maybe the truth is that some of us spend far too long, far, far too much time thinking about what Satan's doing yeah. and, uh, and not enough about what the Lord Jesus is doing. Yeah. And, and, and so Paul, is, is, is 16 chapters and he's almost over before he mentions him. And the only time he mentions Satan is that the God of peace is going to crush him under our feet shortly. So, so let's keep things in perspective. Okay, so the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly, it says. You know, back in, the, in, in chapter 8, verse 37, uh, the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, and that is Christ. We are more than conquerors in and through Christ. But you know, if you, if you care to look at that passage, that, that verse, that statement comes right in the middle of a series of verses in which Paul the Apostle refers to various, shall we say, adverse circumstances that, that Christian believers may face in their life. He refers to tribulation and distress. He refers to uh, persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and sword. He talks about death, he talks about life, he talks about angels, principalities and powers. And you know, the principalities and powers includes um, the principalities and powers in this world. I'm talking about governments and dictators and leaders and you, you know the, the kind of thing I mean. He's talking about earthly, human, uh, governmental authority in that sense, but, he, but he, he is also talking about the principalities and powers in the spirit realm, um, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, as they are referred to in Ephesians chapter 6. In other words, all those ranks of, of uh, fallen angels and, um, and uh, demons and evil spirits that, that sided with Satan in the rebellion, Powerful, powerful forces of evil, of the darkness of this age. So he includes, he includes those. He refers to things present. That is to say, things that are happening now in the world. And you know, some of us may, maybe at times feel overcome by what is happening in the world today. But that, that includes things present. That's, that's what is happening to us now and things to come. In other words, what, what, whatever might happen in the future, or, or even whatever we fear might happen in the future. And, and sometimes there's a, there's a world of difference between what actually happens and what you feared might happen, isn't it? And, so, and sometimes, you know, what you fear might happen never actually comes to pass, but you still bring yourself down fearing over it, you know, and, and so, so it includes all of that. 
And then he refers to height and depth and any created thing. He is basically referring to anything that may come against us or does come against us or we think might come against us that has power to defeat us and to bring us down and ultimately separate us from God and his love. He's, he's, he's talking about all the different kinds of things that might happen or we think might happen. And right in the middle of all of that, he says, yet in all these things, we, that is to say, we who are saved by the grace of God, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And here then in chapter 16, he says, in fact, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Okay, but the trouble is, we don't always feel like conquerors, do we? We don't always feel like conquerors. In fact, in fact, there are times in our life, well, I can only speak for myself, but I assume it's the same for, for many of us. There are, there are times in our life when, when actually we feel weak. We don't feel like conquerors at all. We, we feel weak. We, we, may, we may feel at times defeated. There may be times in our life when we feel like everything is against us and it appears as though Satan has the upper hand. You know, the devil, the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that. And, you know, and, and it, it may feel sometimes in our life that the devil has the, the upper hand. It says here, the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet shortly. But there are many times, for some of us at least, when we feel crushed under his feet. Like he has the victory. So th this morning, I want us to think about this and I, I want to remind you of the truth concerning the enemy, Satan, because we need to be reminded. I think we give him far, far too much credit, you know, for what for what's happening. We need to be reminded who he is. And, and I want to remind you how you overcome him. You've got to understand how you overcome him. And, and, and I want us to, to understand, if I get to it, what, what, um, what this means, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. You, my, your feet, my feet. Okay, and, I, and so I want to begin this morning then by thinking about how Jesus' disciples and followers felt after he was taken from them and crucified, before he was raised from the dead. Okay, so we're, we're in the three days between... Yeah, I want us to think a little bit about how they probably felt. Okay, so when, when the mob came to arrest Jesus in the garden, led by Judas Iscariot, we're told that after, after a few moments, most of them fled. Most of them did a runner. Peter, of course, drew a sword and started waving it around. <laughs> and he, he actually sliced the ear off of the high priest's servant. And um, which must have hurt, but I guess the high priest's servant were thinking he was glad Peter wasn't a better shot without a better swordsman because two inches to the left he'd have sliced his head in half, of course. But, but it, as, it, as it happened, he sliced his ear off. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. And he, and he healed the man's ear. He put, he put it back on and, and healed it. And, uh, of course, removed all the evidence <laughs> in the process. Like, so, so he healed him. The disciples fled, all except, it seems, for Peter and John, who followed behind to see what would happen. And uh, maybe they were hoping that Jesus would be released after all. And, and that perhaps they wanted to be there when Jesus came out. Or perhaps Peter hoped to rescue Jesus uh, from, from his captors. He didn't do a very good of it, job of it in the garden, but, but maybe he hoped for some opportunity to, to rescue Jesus from his captors. In the event, Peter ended up denying Jesus three times and Jesus wasn't released. He spent the whole night being taken from one place to another, trial after trial. And if, I, if I'm reading it correctly, he went first to, to the house of Annas the high priest, 
and then he went from Annas to Caiaphas and then he was taken from Caiaphas before the Sanhedrin from the Sanhedrin to Pontius Pilate from Pilate to Herod and then back to Pontius Pilate this is not one trial this is all night long he goes from pillar to post he's under at least five different separate uh, trials there and um, and and then and then the following day he was taken out and crucified after denying Jesus Peter wept bitterly when the cock crowed and he remembered Jesus words says he wept bitterly as for John well whatever his reasons were for for following after Jesus and it says he he, he, he knew the person on the door at the high priests um, home and he, and he was actually allowed in um, wh wh whatever his his reasons were um, he, he failed in, 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 in his quest I suppose to to see Jesus released and uh, he didn't change the outcome at all he personally went and watched the crucifixion um, he stood next to the cross with Jesus mother and some of the other women and he watched while Jesus was nailed to the cross and crucified and he stood by the cross at least for for a certain amount of time he stood by the cross as Jesus was dying and when Jesus died um, some of them followed uh, Joseph and Nicodemus as they they took his dead body and laid it in a tomb and they watched as as those men hurriedly prepared the body for burial according to Jewish custom and I say hurriedly because the special Sabbath of that year was approaching and and would begin sometime round about uh, 6 p.m. and so they had to do this hurriedly to get the job done before the special Sabbath arrived and and so the women who followed they knew exactly where the tomb was and then later they heard whether they were still there at this time I'm not quite sure but but certainly they heard that a Roman seal had been placed on that tomb and a Roman guard had been put at the tomb uh, armed to the teeth and under strict instructions that they were not to allow anyone to tamper with the grave or remove the body and so with the rest of the disciples it seems they returned to that place where where Jesus had, had shared the last supper with his disciples and they locked themselves in for fear fear that the authorities would be coming for them next so they locked in and and, and so what I want to suggest to you this morning is that these men and women probably felt totally demoralized at this point in time they'd expected Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel they'd, they'd, they'd expected him to do that they'd expected him to destroy the enemies of Israel and to take his place on David's throne and to, to establish his governmental rule and reign over the nation of Israel just as the prophets had said in the Old Testament they thought that they might, certainly some of them did, they thought that they might have positions within Jesus' government. Can I sit at your right hand? You know, um, well, the sons of Zebedee got the mother to ask, can my son sit at your right hand and on your left when you come into the kingdom? In other words, they, they were hoping for some position within the government when he established his governmental rule over the people of Israel they'd expected him to to usher in the golden age of the messianic uh, the messianic kingdom but now he was dead so what were they to make of all of this dead well of course if they'd heard and I mean heard so as to understand what Jesus had told them on a number of occasions before this they would have known that Sunday was coming soon and that when Sunday came when the first day of the week came when the feast of first fruits arrived he would be alive from the dead he'd be raised from the dead if they'd heard if they had heard so as to understand and here's the trouble folks we can hear but sometimes we hear but we don't understand it doesn't go in okay so they've, they've heard Jesus on several occasions say we're going up to Jerusalem and um, 
and I will be betrayed into the hands of, of those who hate me. And uh, I'll be beaten, I'll be scourged and crucified, but on the third day I'll rise again. But somehow that had, that had got past them. Somehow they, they hadn't heard that, unfortunately. Unfortunately, they hadn't understood. And so now they were downhearted and confused. You know, not many hours before they thought the kingdom was, they, th they thought he was going to be on the throne of David, but now he's dead. And so, and so I put it to you, they're downhearted and they are confused. They felt deflated, I guess. Depressed even. And certainly they must have felt defeated at this point in time. Peter had said in front of everyone, even if they all deny you, I never will. I am prepared to go to prison and even die for you, Jesus, he said. But in the event, he denied him, even when a servant girl asked if he was one of his disciples or pointed him out. You're one of his disciples. He denied him. Point I'm making, friends, is that at this point in time, the disciples and followers of Jesus must have felt anything but con felt like anything but conquerors at this point in time. As for the enemies of Christ, as far as they were concerned, and I'm talking about the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious elite who, who, who hated Jesus, they must have thought they'd won. Mustn't they? they? They must have thought they've won. They'd wanted to get rid of Jesus for ages now, and now they've finally done it. He was dead. They'd seen it with their own eyes. Dead. And they knew the Roman centurion had, had uh, 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 given the, the, the certificate of it. He'd certified Jesus dead. And they knew it. The hearts must have been rejoicing. We finally achieved what we've been trying to do for, for absolutely ages. Certified dead. And now he's laid out on a stone cold slab in Joseph's tomb. Joseph, he was one of us, he was, he was part of the Sanhedrin, turned cold. He turns out he's a, a Jesus follower and he's, he's given his tomb to him, but nevertheless, Jesus is dead, laid out on a cold stone slab. And just in case his disciples had planned to take his body and claim he rose from the dead or something like that, they'd even got the Roman governor to put a Roman seal on the tomb. Which, if anyone breaks a Roman seal, any unauthorised person breaks that seal, the penalty is death. That, that, is, that is transgression against the emperor himself. So they got a Roman seal, and they even got a Roman guard, armed to the teeth, to guard the tomb. So these men, these enemies of Jesus, must have been laughing. They must have been thinking, well... We've, we've finally accomplished what we've been trying to do for ages. He's dead. Go home now and enjoy the feast. As for Satan and the hordes of demons that are with him, well, I don't profess to know what they were thinking when Jesus breathed his last and died. I don't profess to know. I don't know if for a split second when he breathed his last, they thought they'd won. I don't know if, if for a moment in time, they thought they'd defeated him at last. But if they did entertain such a thought, they soon discovered they were mistaken. Because we are told in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, that having been put to death in the flesh... He was made alive by the Spirit, by whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly disobedient in the days of Noah. So what's that, what's that all about? Actually, let me, let, let me just turn to that and, and read, read the, the, the whole passage there. First, uh, first Timothy, uh, sorry, first Peter and, um, and uh, chapter 2. Sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, 
by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So it says that Jesus, in the spirit, went and preached to these spirits who are in prison. And, uh, and preach there means, it simply means proclaimed. Okay, because some people have suggested, what is Jesus doing here? Is he going, you know, preaching the gospel to those who've already died and gone before? You know, give them, give them a chance now that he's been raised. No, it doesn't mean that at all. He went and he proclaimed something. And, and, and what this is telling us is that after Jesus was put to death in the flesh, he went and proclaimed his victory to the spirits in prison. And, and it's those Peter refers to in his second epistle in chapter 2 and verse 4, where it says, If God did not spur the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. It's talking about them. These are spirits. These are evil, fallen evil spirits. And it says that they've been consigned to hell. Now, interestingly, the word hell there is the Greek, is the Greek word Tartarus. And uh, Tartarus refers to, to the lowest pit of hell that is reserved for these evil spirits. Okay, so what, what, is, what has Jesus done? He's, he's gone down and he proclaims to them his victory. That he's, risen, he's died, he's accomplished everything the Father sent him to do. He comes to proclaim his victory. So if they, I'm talking about these evil spirits in Tartarus, in hell, if they were hoping that their chief, Satan, was going to finally win the day, that he, he, he was going to get the victory over the Son of God, and, uh, and he would then have the keys of death and hell and come and set them free well they were sorely disappointed now you see what, what looked like defeat when Christ died on the cross what looked like defeat when he breathed his last wasn't defeat at all it was victory it was victory, victory over sin, victory over death, victory over hell, victory over Satan, victory over sickness and disease and everything else that is against us. All the stuff on Paul's list in, in Romans chapter 8 that I, that I referred to at the beginning, he's won a complete victory over all of that. And if those standing by the cross, including Satan himself, had been listening carefully they would have heard what Jesus said before he died. He said, it is finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. Tetelestai in Greek. Debt cancelled. It's over. It's done. Com work complete. And then he looked to heaven and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathed his last, knowing that he had completed in its entirety the work his father had given him to do. He'd made atonement for sin. He'd satisfied the divine justice. And to use the words of Colossians chapter 2, he, he cancelled out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's taken it away, it says. In fact, I, I, I want us to, uh, let, let's just turn to that um, passage in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. And, and uh, let, me just, let me just read that. It says, um, verse 14 of chapter 2, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. You see, what they did in ancient time, I think I referred to this the other week, is that if, if you committed some crime, and uh, you were, say, say the, say the uh, punishment was imprisonment, they would they would put you in your prison cell 
And uh, on a parchment or on a board, usually, they would write your name and uh, they would list the crimes that you, you were guilty of and they would also write underneath you know, what the penalty was according to the law, five years imprisonment, ten years imprisonment, whatever it was. And they would nail it to the door of your cell and you would not get out until you'd paid in full the, 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 the penalty determined by the law. So when you've done your five year stretch or whatever you got, then they would let you out and they would write across across the board, across all of your crimes and all your misdemeanours, they would write the word tetelestai. It is finished. Debt cancelled. And they would give it to you. And off you would go. And if you, if you were outside and anybody says, said to you, 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 I mean, you, you did such and such and you, know, you deserve to, to, to be in prison. You could get your parchment out or your board and you could say, no, I, I paid my debt to society. There it is, tetelestai. It is, are you with me? So, so it, that's proof, you see, that the, the handwriting of offences that was against you has been cancelled out because you've paid your debt to society. Point of what Paul is saying here is that when Christ was on the cross, you see, all our sins were laid upon him and nailed with him to the cross. And so, there he hung until he'd done the time, until the debt was paid. And then he cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished, and he died. And what that means is, you see, the handwriting of offences, your offences, and my offences, there are too many to, I've even forgotten most of them, too many to name, were all laid on Christ and nailed to his cross. And he paid for it all. You get it? So, by doing that, you see, Paul says he's disarmed principalities and powers. In other words, through what he, he accomplished there at the cross, Christ has won a complete victory over Satan and the hosts of wickedness and he has completely stripped them of any power to take us down. I'm talking about those who were saved by the grace of God. You see, the question is, what power could Satan possibly have to separate us from God or send us to hell? What, what possible power could he have, have had? Well, I tell you now, he has none. It, 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 it says in that um, passage I, I read earlier in the meeting and uh, from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, in verse 56, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, it's sin that brings forth death, isn't it? Sin brings forth death, but the thing that gives it the power and strength is the law, the law of God. So that Satan, the accuser of the brethren, comes, as it were, before God, and he points to me, or he points to you, and he says, that one has sinned. That one has broken your law. And your law says the wages of sin is death. He says to God the audacity of it. But we have an advocate with the Father. One who speaks in our defence. Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sin. What is a propitiation? It's a sacrifice of atonement. It's, it's one who, who stands in as a substitute on whom... The, the penalty, and in this case, the wrath of God, is poured on that substitute and therefore averted away from those on whom it was originally, uh, 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 who originally fell under it. So at one point, we were all under the condemnation of God. And it was a matter of time, unless something happened, you know, to, to, to cancel this out, it was a matter of time before we would come under the full vent of God's wrath and that would mean eternal condemnation in hell. But the substitute stood in our place, hung in our place, 
And, and the wrath that should have been upon me was poured out upon him. And he soaked it all up to the last drop. He felt it all in his own body. He experienced it all in himself for me. In taking our sin upon himself on the cross, he paid the penalty in full for all of our sins. And so he fully satisfied all the demands of the law on our behalf through his sacrificial death. Therefore, Satan has no legal basis on which to accuse or, or, or um, uh, ins insist that God should condemn any of us to hell. He has no legal basis because the demands of the law have been met, do you see? So, so, you know, the Son of God, the Son of God won a complete victory over Satan there at the cross. And not only Satan, he won a complete victory over sin and death and hell. Guess who owns, guess who has the keys of death and hell? Revelation 1, Revelation 1 verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and death. Satan cannot drag you down to hell. He don't, you don't have the keys. I don't know if there was a time he did, I don't, I don't know. But I don't care, because he doesn't have them now. Jesus has the keys of death and hell. So he cannot drag you down to hell. So, so if you're listening, anybody listening to it, if you've been listening to a voice, if you, if you are a genuine believer and you're listening to a voice that says, what if I get dragged down to hell? What if I end up in hell? Then let me tell you something, my friend, you're listening to the wrong voice. Because Satan don't have the keys, Jesus does. The Son of God has the keys. In fact, according to Colossians 2 verse 15, not only did Jesus disarm the principalities and powers, but it says he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. And you see, there is a reference there to, uh, to the, the Roman um, triumphal procession in ancient times. What they did was they, if, if Rome sent out some conquering general to some land somewhere to, to conquer some some uh, uh, tribe or some nation and uh, and victory was won when that when that roman general came back to rome with with his his um, his his soldiers with his his army they would arrange this this triumphal procession and um, and the streets of rome would be lined with people and, uh, and uh, the conquering general, he would be at the front of the procession. And he'd be in this chariot with, with four white horses. And he would have on his head a laurel wreath, a crown. He's the conquering general. And all the crowds would cheer him. And behind him would be some of his soldiers. And behind them there would be carts being pulled along. And these carts would have the spoils of war. The things they'd taken from the defeated enemy. You know, the wealth, the riches, the, 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 the possessions, they will be displayed before all of Rome, the spoils of war. And then behind them, there would be representatives of the defeated four in chains. So, so there might be the king of the defeated nation bowed low in chains and dragged through the streets of Rome, followed by defeated soldiers and the people they'd taken from this defeated nation, all in chains coming behind the, the general, you see, it's a triumphal procession, and it's, and it's displaying, making a public spectacle of the enemies of Rome. And what Paul's saying, that's what Jesus did. See, that's what Jesus did. When he won the victory on the cross, he not only disarmed the principalities and powers, including Satan, but he actually made a public spectacle of them in a, in a kind of triumphal procession. And so, having died and been buried, he was raised to life on the third day by the glory of the Father. And he showed himself alive. Alive in a resurrection body. The victory is his friends. He has conquered. He has crushed Satan's head. 
He has stripped him of his power. Do you know, do you know what? Let me tell you something this morning. Satan doesn't even have any power to make you sin. So that, that thing, Satan made me do it. The, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. The devil suggested very strongly that you should. And the devil gives you every reason to sin, but he can't make you sin. He has no power to do so. Okay, but the question might be asked, if Satan is a defeated foe, how come he's out there? Because he is, you know. He's still out there. For the time being. For as long as God allows it. And as far as it serves God's ultimate purpose. He's out there. And it says, it says he, is, he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we have to understand this, friends. He's got a big bark. He's got a big roar. So what can he do exactly? To you, I'm talking to believers now. What exactly can he do? If he's a defeated foe, what can he do? To believers, I mean. If he can't take us to hell, as we've already established he can't, what exactly can he do? Well, he can lie. He's the a, a father of lies. And he's, you know, I don't mean to give him any compliments, he's very good at it. He's a seasoned liar from the very beginning. He can lie, he can deceive, he can stir up those who are under his power against us, and he does. He can sow division in churches by bringing along those who cause divisions and offences contrary to biblical doctrine. He puts them in. The tares amongst the wheat. And they, they slip in little bits of heresy here and there. And it, and it weakens. It's like poison. It weakens and it destroys. And he puts them in. And he puts others in. Divisive, divisive people who cause hurt and who cause trouble within the fellowship. He brings people like that in. He can rob us of our peace by getting us to fill our minds up with all sorts of negative garbage. And he's very good at this. Fill your mind up with all kinds of negative rubbish. He can bombard us with lies because he's the father of lies. And he will tell us that we are so weak and pathetic and sinful that God couldn't possibly love us. And that actually we've sinned so many times, we've sinned once too often, and yes, you're going to end up in hell after all. He, that's the sort of thing that he will say. He can try to lead us into an unhealthy interest in him and in the occult and in all the evil that's going on in the world. One songwriter put it like this. He can be fascinating, he can be dull. He can ride down Niagara Falls in the barrels of your skull. And, and what he meant by that, in a poetic way, what he's saying is simply this. If you let his lies get into your head... What he is going to do is he's going to take you for a ride. And it will not be a happy ride. It will be a ride, it will take you on a hike to nowhere. If you let him get into your head. Okay, but 1 Corinthians 15 verses 56 and 57 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Romans 8 verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Romans 16 verse 20, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. So I want to finish off this morning just very quickly by reminding you how you get the victory over the evil one. First of all, we, we have to recognise, and this is the main purpose of my message this morning, we have to recognise that he is a defeated foe. Although, having said that, we should not underestimate his power and ability to cause trouble. We should understand something of his strategies. 
Uh, you, you know, uh, Paul says somewhere, doesn't he, that you, you know, we're not ignorant of his devices. In other words, we, we ought to know and understand. You know, any, any, any uh, 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 army who wants, any king who wants to go and do, uh, uh, to battle with, a, with a, an enemy needs to understand something of their capabilities and their strategies, don't they? Otherwise, a very foolish general who goes to battle against someone, he has no idea what kind of weapons they've got, he's got no idea of the sorts of strategies they use, he's got no idea of the strengths and weaknesses of, of the enemy. No, a good general will make sure he's got inte good intelligence on the enemy, so he knows what kind of weapons they use, he knows how they come, he knows how many archers they've got, how many foot soldiers they've got, how much cavalry they've got. If he can understand all of that, then he can prepare. And so, so we are, without having an unhealthy interest in <laughs> Satan, we should have an understanding of how he comes and, and the power that he has. You know, sometimes you, you, you know, you'd, you'd hear these preachers, um, usually, yeah, and I don't mean any, I'm not knocking any particular uh, point of view or, uh, or, or um, uh, 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 movement here, but often from a sort of Pentecostal charismatic background, well, we're gonna crush the head of Satan, crush the head of Satan. As, uh, that kind of thing, which is, which is fine, of course, but, but we, we have to understand, friends, that it's not, you know, it's not just a question of making some statement like that. We, we have to understand the power of, of the enemy. I mean, the story goes of Smith Wigglesworth years and years ago, woke up in the middle of the night and, and um, there's a demon sat at the end of his bed. I don't, I don't know whether it's true or whether it's one of these urban myths, but he wakes up in the middle of the night and there's a demon sat at the end of, the, uh, of his bed. And he just looked at it and said, oh, it's only you, turned over and went back to sleep again. You know, which, which, he, but, but like, which all sounds like kind of, you know, but we, got to under, we shouldn't underestimate the devil's power. That's, that's all I'm saying. Let's not underestimate he is a powerful, powerful foe. So get your armour on, Ephesians 6. I haven't got time to go into that this morning, but we've got to have our armour on, full armour of God. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, we have to resist him. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Don't resist him. Don't welcome him and have a conversation. Resist him. And we have to remember, this is so important, how we overcome him. So, Revelation chapter 12. Um, verse, um, halfway down verse 10. The accuser of our brethren, that's Satan. The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to death. That's how you overcome him. You know, if the devil comes and, you know, he's having a go and, you know, pointing out sin in your life and telling you, you know, you've sinned too many times now, my friend, you know, it's over for you and, you know, all that kind of thing. You're a perpetual backslider, you know, God can't possibly love you. And, you know, the, the kind of ways he comes, you know, that. that. Whatever you do, don't tell him how, mu how, 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 how much you've kind of improved over the years, you know. Don't, don't, don't say to him, yeah, but you should have seen me before. You know, I'm not better than I used to be. You know, there's a work of sanctification going on in my heart and I'm a much better person than I used to be. Don't do that. Because, because he probably knows every skeleton in your cupboard. You don't overcome him by telling him how good you are. Because he'll point out some place in your life where you're not all that good. So you overcome him, it says, by the blood of the lamb. What's that? Well, it's what we've been talking about this morning. You overcome him by telling him, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I'm a ma an absolute waster. But, but Jesus shed his blood on the cross for me. And when, and when, when he, just before he died, he said, it is finished. Debt cancelled. So you're right, and I'm not proud of what I did. But Jesus paid for that. It's the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all unrighteousness. And by his blood, I'm justified. That's how you overcome it. And by the word of their testimony. What's that? 
It's not that I'm better than I used to be. You know what, to see how much my life has improved. No, your testimony is your faith in the blood of Christ. My testimony is, is not that I'm a, you know, I think I'm on my way to perfection. I hope I am. But my, my, my testimony is not I've done this and I've done that. My testimony is my faith is in the blood of, of the Lamb. It's in what he accomplished for me at the cross of Calvary. And, and the fact that he rose again from the dead. And by rising from the dead, the Father proved conclusively that he accepted his once and for all offering as sufficient to deal with my sin. That's my testimony. And they did not love their life to death. In other words, you know, the devil says, I've got the power to kill you. But I actually don't believe he has. But even if, even if somebody wanted to believe he did, or else, or else he, you know, he, he raises up some of his pawns and puppets to... To, 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 to kill us as Christians because this happens well they did not love their life unto death is I'd rather die than deny him it's, it, it's, it's Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego listen oh king you know, I, we believe our God is able to deliver us from your fiery furnace but even if he doesn't, doesn't we're still not going to bow to your, your image so there you, 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 that's, that's, you know, I'd rather die in other words I'd rather die <laughs> to give it up. That's what it means and that's how you overcome him. Here also in Romans 16 we are, we are shown what it is we should do as believers by the way. It says in verse, um, where is it, verse 19 it says be wise in what is good and be innocent in what is evil. In other words while we're still here Fill your mind with what is good and engage yourself with what is good in the sight of God. And don't give yourself and don't give your time and attention to what is evil. Now, as I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, I do believe we, we, we ought to know what's going on in the world. But, but honestly, folks, you know, some of that can become obsessive. To, to some of us and I think if we obsess with all of that then it's going to drag you down you've got to be aware otherwise it's like these people who bury their head in the sand I don't think that does anybody any good you've got to know what's going on but don't obsess with it obsess with what is good see See, if you obsess with all the negative and all the bad stuff, that's how he gets in. That's how he robs us of our peace. But the God of peace crushes him under our feet when we refuse to take the bait. That is, that's his, his, his power to draw us away. You know, I don't go fishing like, but uh, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I, you know, rod and line, you know. and So, you, so you, you, you set it all up, you put your hook on and you've got... You've got a, a worm or something on the end of it, you bait, you know, and you, 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 put, it, you put it in the water and you wait like till the fish bites your bait. Because when it bites the bait, the hook goes into its mouth and you can pull it in. But if the fish don't take the bait, then you can't draw it in either, can you? You don't sit there all day waiting for that float to move. If the fish doesn't take the bait, you can't draw it in. So, so when, when Satan presents you with all this negative, all this garbage. Don't take the bait. Know what's going on, but don't obsess. Because if you obsess, he'll reel it in. He'll draw you away, you see. And I know some, some people might be thinking, no, you, you can talk, you spent last, you know, how many months? 15 months talking about all the perilous times, you know. Well, I, I know, I know, and, and honestly, it's a, I'll be honest with you, it's a burden, some of that. But, but I, I, I feel and I, I, and I hope that those messages are not all... Of, I hope there's the positive aspect of, of how God's delivering us from... What God's done to deliver us from all of that. It's, not all, it's, it's certainly not from my point of view. It isn't intended to bring before everybody all this woe and all this 
stuff, you know, for, for uh, three quarters of an hour, an hour every Sunday night. That's not my intention. It's, it's to, it's to, um, to uh, expose the, the, the works of darkness and to show what God has done to save us from that. And, and from my point of view as a pastor, I think it behoves me to know what's going on in the world to be able to warn people about that. But I have to be very careful. I'm telling you that now. I want to be very careful because too much of that turn you into a basket case. You know what I mean? It, it, re it really will. It, seriously. You know, you've got to balance it. And, it. and if you're looking at that all day and not reading the word, I, I'm, you're, you're in for trouble. If you're doing all that and you're not spending time with the Lord, you're in for trouble. Seriously. Okay, but, but one, one last thing here. Because I think here, there's, there's also a reference to our final victory over Satan. When he will no longer even be able to tempt us or to expose us to anything. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. You see, there's coming a, a day, sometime soon, and we're going to be delivered, even out of this present darkness, into the presence of the Lord Jesus himself, through the rapture, and the devil ain't going to touch you there, ever again. He ain't going to come, he ain't going to tempt you anymore. All you're going to do is you, you, you're going to see the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus. And you know, and that's the rapture. And then after the tribulation, we're coming back with him, you know. And, uh, and that's when he will set up the messianic kingdom. And you know, Peter will be there, and John will be there, and the others will be there, and Paul will be there, and all the great saints from down the centuries, they'll all be there. So if you've got any questions, you know, write them down, and you'll be, you'll, you'll be able to ask them when you see them. And, and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years in his kingdom of righteousness, during which, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So imagine this world restored to the kind of beauty of the, the, the Eden before the fall. That's the messianic kingdom. And, and we're going to reign with Christ during that thousand years and then afterwards for all eternity we'll be with him in the new heaven and new earth in which righteousness alone dwells. That's our future. And Satan will have no, no uh, opportunity to ever come at us again. In the meantime, fill your mind up, fill your heart up with him. And with all that is good and noble and pure and beautiful and of good report. And uh, don't take his bait. Well, I, I, I trust that some of that um, will be helpful to some of us this morning. But let's, let's, uh, let's uh, sing our, our final hymn.